Today we're bottling the long tail experiment. I've taken my Amarone kits, split them into two, fermented one conventionally, and the other one I left soaking on the skins for an extra month. And we're going to see how those turn out. Uh, today I'm bottling them to give them, give them a chance to age out a little bit uh, before we taste them, although we will taste them right now just to make sure everything's okay on the way into the bottle. Um, I've racked them off the finings. I haven't filtered them because I want to see what they uh, go through um, through a natural aging process. Now I'm in a space uh, in an on-premise winemaking operation. If you're not familiar with that, in the place where I live, there are home winemaking centers where people can go and purchase a wine kit, make it right in place, and take it through the entire process and model it there. Uh, because my own house is completely stuffed to the top with fermenters and all kinds of other things, uh, I leave space here to do some winemaking. Uh, and uh, it's very convenient because they have some great equipment that I can have access to. There's a, a bottle washer where you can wash 30 bottles in uh, just a couple of minutes and it sanitizes them and everything. It's fantastic. Uh, there's this bottle filling machine. It's a four-headed enomatic bottle filler. Works on a vacuum system. Uh, I expect that um, filling all of the bottles will take me less than about two and a half minutes. Well, you'll have a look at that on video. And uh, in the other corner, we have a pneumatically operated corking machine, which will put the corks in the bottles very rapidly. Uh, this isn't the uh, equipment that most people have in their own homes, but I thought it'd be really cool for you to see how this stuff worked. Uh, it's a snap and it's a great setup, so I'm gonna take advantage of it today. Let's go. This machine works on a vacuum system. Underneath the countertop, there's a vacuum pump, which is drawing air outside of the clear plastic cylinder you see in the left-hand side. As the air pressure is reduced in that, the hoses that you see going to the top of those filler heads begin to suck air from out of the bottles. Now there's a second hose that you can see on the right hand side there uh, that's supplying the wine. As the air is pulled out of the bottle, wine flows to the tube to replace it and there's a tricky little uh, o-ring and valve set up there and when the wine reaches the very top of the bottle it doesn't continue uh, to fill, it pulls the wine off the top and puts it into that clear plastic cylinder on the left. That's a vacuum reservoir. It also catches any overflow. In this way, every bottle is filled to the same level every time. And as you can see, this is fairly quick. Uh, I did just the first three bottles in under about 30 seconds. Uh, with no fuss and muss or fiddling around. This is actually running pretty slow. When these things are brand new out of the box and set up for production, one person can basically just about keep up with them slipping bottles on and off at high speed. This motor's been detuned because there's a lot of um, people who have uh, perhaps uh, lesser motor skills that would not be comfortable keeping up with something going that fast. But as you can see, this is only going to take a few minutes uh, to get the entire batch into bottles and finished. And the big advantage isn't as much the speed as it is there's no fiddling around getting that level exactly right in every bottle. If you have filled with a um, plain old hose, you know that that's messy and, and fiddly. And even if you're using a, one of the wonderful bottling ones with a one-way shutoff valve, uh, you'll see that um, and that's just my, my co-star there, you'll see that it takes a little bit of fiddling to get every bottle up to the right level and there they never quite match up and you've got to dribble a little more in or pour some out. And the great advantage of this is every bottle's filled to exactly the same level every time with no overfill or underfill. So it's a pretty cool piece of technology. Here we are getting down to the very end. You can expect to get between 28 and 28 and a half bottles out of a standard batch of wine. Now, the standard batch is 6 US gallons or 23 liters, but there is a slight loss. So if you do the math, you're not going to get 30 full bottles. However, the instructions do tell you to clean 30 bottles and have them on hand in most cases. And that's because there are some older carboys, products of a technology 100 years ago, uh, that were based on water bottles for water coolers. And those carboys uh, often had quite a lot of variation in their interior volume. Better manufacturing standards and much better carboys uh, today have that tightened up to the actual 6 US gallon volume, which is 22.7 liters. 
Now that could theoretically produce 30 bottles, but there's some losses, and unless you're topping up to the tippy top every time, and your hoses don't magically retain any uh, um, of the wine inside, you can count on 28 and a half bottles approximately, which is nice because you've got uh, two cases, four bottles, and uh, a glass to enjoy while you're bottling. And that's it. Now we're ready to start corking. This is a pneumatic corker. Inside the machine is a pneumatic ram powered by a compressor in another room. It uses that compressor's power to force that finger poking down from the top to shove a cork through a narrowing cone that compresses it small enough to go inside the neck of the bottle and sticks it in there very cleanly and neatly. This is a very efficient process. Uh, it's um, a little tiny bit noisy with the compressor running, which is why I'm doing a voiceover now. But you can see here, bottle goes in, the base plate locks, cork goes in the top, ram sticks it down through the narrowing cone, pops it into the top of the bottle, and neat as a pin, it goes into the same level every time. If you've ever used a standard corker, which we call the Italian one-armed rolling machine, you know that it's a great machine, but this is something else. It's judgment day. Both wines have sat for about a week after bottling uh, in order to calm down and get over bottling shock. Uh, they've been stored in the same area of the cellar. They are the same temperature. Uh, it's the same place. I've got two identical tasting glasses. And now we're going to find out. Just to recap, the purpose of this experiment is to see if an extended maceration on grape skins in a wine kit has the same effect that it does in grape winemaking we would expect to see tannins polymerize over time, uh, recombine in different ways, and a bunch of small, subtle uh, microbiological and biochemical effects on the wine as it ages in contact with a lot of polyphenolic um, material. In short, we'd expect the wine to evolve very differently uh, with the extended grape skin contact. So one of these wines, uh, which I'm tasting blind, by the way. I don't know which one is which, but one of them uh, was made very conventionally, racked off after a couple of weeks in the grape skins, and then put through its natural process in the um, instruction set. The other one sat on the grape skins for nearly two months, along with the oak. Uh, now, you would think, um, conventionally, just from a, a pure chemical standpoint, sitting that long on the grape skins would extract a lot of bitter tannins. Uh, it could be the wine would be very unpleasant. In grapes, it's a very different experience. The tannin profile does go up initially, but after a while it comes back down and comes into balance with the smoother, uh, softer, more mouth-filling tannins taking prominence and the wine having a more developed character. Uh, it's a technique that some people use, other people don't, uh, but we're seeing how it affects a kit wine with grape skins. So, moment of truth. Both wines look substantially the same. I noticed this throughout the process. The only difference between the two during processing was uh, one had a bit more trapped gas, and that was the one that was done conventionally. Uh, but the color is the same. The clarity is good. Uh, the hue is lovely and young. I didn't filter these wines. So I wanted to see what they were like without the benefit of filtration, although I do filter almost all of my wines because I think it makes them lovely and pretty and sparkling to the eye. But these are perfectly clear. So, let's start over here. <sighs> big fruit, really big, rich, very ripe dark fruit. Uh, there's some blackberry, there's some dark, dark cherry, there's a hint of raisins. Uh, there's also a floral note that's very pleasant. Uh, but underneath it's got a real vibrancy and depth. There's almost like a cooked strawberry as well. Uh, something that I, I often get off of Amarone style wines, um, not like a fresh strawberry, not that brightness, but like a, a jam that's been cooked down really hard. Um, it's, it's, I would say it's a candy-like flavor, but most people would regard that as being a negative. Oh, candy in the wine, that tastes terrible. No, it's, it's a lovely little note underneath everything. Let's try the other one. Wow, substantially different. It has masses of dark fruit as well, but it's much more austere. The uh, aromas seem to be 
Well, I don't want to overstep my, my or overguess myself. The aromas seem more mature, more fully developed. I'm getting more bouquet than aroma. Uh, and conventionally, bouquet is everything that doesn't come from the fruit in a wine. So oak character, uh, characters and esters derived from the yeast, um, byproducts of aging. Those uh, are referred to as bouquet. It's, it's, you don't have to really worry about it. It's just kind of a convention. Um, but this has, seems to have more bouquet. I also get a, a minerality uh, that I am not getting out of the other one. I mean, it's, it's lovely and exuberant and fruity, but this one... Wow, that seems vastly more mature. I am quite intrigued. Well, let's, let's try them. Mm. Really big, rich fruit. Holy smokes. There's a lot of alcohol in this wine. Amarone is traditionally a very high alcohol wine, uh, and this one is no exception. It's not hot enough to warm on the way down, but it's got a headiness that you can detect right away. Um, and there's also a sweetness, but it's not a sugar sweetness. And uh, it's entirely appropriate to this wine. The sweetness is coming from the alcohol. It's a sweetness that's on the sides and the back of the tongue. If you, if you ever just taste a solution of sugar water or water and alcohol, the sugar water solution will taste sweet right on the tip of the tongue. The alcohol and water solution, as long as it's below about 18%, won't taste as sweet on the tip of the tongue. It'll taste sweeter on the back and sides. Now that aside, um, that is a rich, mellow wine. The oak is present as a toastiness, uh, but not as an astringency and a little hint of smokiness. It's, it's very pleasant. Um, I'm surprised this does not taste like a wine that's only been in the, the bottle for a week. Let's try the other one. Mm. A huge attack on the palate. A lot more tannin coming on a lot sooner. But also, there is a youthful fruit character that I think is highly characteristic of any wine that is under about a year old in the bottle, especially a red wine. They tend to have a, a very effusive fruit character uh, that's, that can be kind of overwhelming before they develop uh, a more mature character reflecting the élevage or the, the um, change in passage of time in the bottle. Uh, it's very nice, but it seems very, very young compared to this wine. And yet they sat on the shelf for exactly the same length of time. The only difference is that one of them got its grape skins racked off earlier. Okay, so now it's time for me to judge. I'm going to guess that this one is, well, I'm not even going to guess. I am virtually certain that this one is the one that had the extended grape skin maceration. There's more development of the post-fermentation character. Uh, it seems drier and more tannic. This has ebullient fruit, which is kind of nice. Uh, you know what? I would love to just sit around with friends and, and gulp this, as shameful as that is with Amarone, because it is a big, powerful wine deserving of respect. I could just guzzle that stuff down. It's, it's fruity and happy. This is more contemplative. I want this with uh, Bisteca Fiorentina. I want you know, a big, substantial, heavy, um, something meaty or, or tomato-based to stand up to that. I want some acid. I want some tannin. I want some fats. I want, want some things like that to go against it. So let's just ask, is this the extended maceration one? Yes. Thank you. So there you have it. Um, initial results after one week uh, confirm the very early results that we did during racking that the extended maceration kit seems to have a lot more going on with uh, maturity of flavor. Now, will that hold up? There are a lot of things that happen to a wine as it ages. Uh, the flavors combine, they get more complex, and things that we like when a wine is young can often fall off and disappear, and flaws often fold up and go away, revealing the inner beauty of the wine. So, uh, we'll come back and revisit this wine in three months and find out just how it is, and I think we're going to wind up doing a food pairing with it just to see how it sets off the flavors and aromas of something really big and rich. Anybody out there like Osobuco? I do. Excellent. I'm Tim Vandegar from Master Vintner. 
Thanks for watching. Remember, with Master Vintner, uncork something special.